So my name is Georgi. I work at SAP, and currently I'm software engineer for the CF Foundation Services API team, and I work out of Sofia, Bulgaria. And hi, everyone. My name's Sam Gunaratna. Uh, I work for Pivotal. I'm an engineer. I work in London, and I work on the same team as Georgi. And so our team's focus is really like the services experience in Cloud Foundry. And more specifically, we look after the Open Service Broker API implementation in CF. So as authors of a platform, like we spend a lot of time thinking about brokers and broker authors and the specification. But we spend a lot of time thinking about it in a very like, abstract way. So this talk is really us sort of taking a step back and trying to think about it more practically um, and really trying to understand, does the spec sort of live up to the reality of what it claims? So <clears throat> what we'll do is we'll do a little level setter and talk a little bit about the API um, and explain it. We'll then have a look at the ecosystem to see sort of what's evolved over the last two years of this thing being um, an open project. Um, then we'll dive into really the title of the talk, which is our demonstration. And then we'll end with some questions and some learnings at the end. Great, so um, we'll try and get through this bit a little bit quick. Uh, so what is the Open Service Broker API? So this is a specification that started in Cloud Foundry a number of years ago. Uh, put simply, it's a way for uh, your applications running in Cloud Foundry to have access to backing services. And the classic example is, I have an application. I want my application to be stateless. I need to store some database. Give me a backing data store. And so two years ago, the Kubernetes community were thinking about similar abstractions. And so instead of going off and forking and making their own specification, they decided to work with Cloud Foundry on the Open Service Broker API, which is a, uh, run by a committee of these companies. And the goals are exactly the same um, as the original specification, except on the Kubernetes platform as well as Cloud Foundry. So it's all about managing service life cycles. OK, what does actually mean? I mean, we will need a little bit more details in order to understand the specification a little bit better. So as part of the specification, we have two main actors in it. The first one is called the platform. A typical example of a platform is Cloud Foundry or Kubernetes. This is the place where our workload lives. The second actor as part of the specification is called a broker. This is the component responsible for creating service instances of a specific type. An example of a broker is the MySQL broker, which is capable of provisioning small, medium, or large plans. So what actually happens behind the scenes when a Cloud Foundry user types the CF create service command? Then the platform behind the scenes makes a provision request, this is another term of the specification, to the broker. And as a result of that provision request, a service instance is created. This means that we have our instance available out there in the cloud waiting for us. OK, so far, so good. We have it. But the next thing that logically we need is we actually need some kind of information in order to connect to that instance. This, in the very... Uh, basic example is some URL, username, and password to connect to that database. This, in the terms of the specification, is called a binding. So again, the platform makes a binding request to the broker based on some kind of user action. And as a result of that binding, a set of credentials are returned back to our application or our container. And we could start working with our instance as normal. OK, to summarize, what is actually the OS BAPI? As you may see from this diagram, the specification is exactly the boundary which defines the contract between the platform and the broker and defines some kind of common workflows related to service instances. OK, but why is this important? So because this is a specification, what it facilitates is like this sort of model where you can have a platform and then a series of brokers offering different services. And the reason you want to do this is you want your developers to have access to like a toolbox of services to build richer applications. But this open service broker spec doesn't really have an opinion about where these services should be deployed. So 
It might be that you have one of your brokers um, hosted on-premise, and there's lots of reasons you might want to do this. Maybe you have um, data regulatory needs, or for performance reasons, or maybe you're backing an existing service that you have in your organization. But equally, you could also just get a service from a cloud provider. So in the case where you want to use um, I don't know, some like, data service, and you don't actually care where it's hosted, you just want, you want access to that service, like, why not get it from an expert, who, like an expert provider who has a lot of experience running these sort of services? So and this is sort of like the heart of our, our talk. And so sort of sparked the question, like, how many services are available from these sort of cloud providers? So we spent a little bit of time scouring the ecosystem of six uh, different providers and found there's like 200 services offered by like all of these providers. And it's a mixture of both SaaS offerings. So you just get a URL and you register it in your platform. And like artifacts that you download and then deploy on premise. And because everybody likes logos, um, here's a lot of logos of all the services that are available that we found. Um, and what was great during this like, exploration wasn't just the variety of services. It was the fact that if, for example, you want a Postgres service, there's actually a bunch of different providers that offer that service. So what that means for you as a consumer, as a platform operator, is that you can pick and choose which provider you get your Postgres from. You could pick based on price or SLO or performance. And if you're not happy, you can switch. So I guess most of you have started wondering where are we going with this talk, because all the things so far were kind of familiar. We saw them on previous uh, summits, on previous talks. We didn't know almost anything new as part of this. So what we actually wanted to do, Sam and I wanted to, pe uh, to put the specification to the test. So we wanted to validate how easy or how hard it is for a developer to actually consume multiple services coming from different cloud providers. So what does the developers do when they want to test a thing? They create an app. So we did. We have created a very simple application with the purposes of this de demonstration. The application consists of two basic nodes, a web node and a worker node. A user is allowed to upload an image to the web node. And then an image is passed to the worker node via messaging queue system. Then the worker tries to classify that image and extend some kind of meaningful information from it, relying on an already trained models coming from an image classification service. And once we have our classification, we store the end result and the input image in a relational database. I guess most of you might be familiar with such an architecture because a lot of, of, of real-world applications rely on similar services. So how actually our app look, looks like back from different cloud providers? Because we think we are kind of pragmatic and we also believe in using the right tools for the job, we decided to rely on the message queue coming from the Google PubSub as our inter-process communication system. We, we also use the IBM Watson Vision Recognition Service with, for the image classification. And last but not least, we use a relational Postgres, dat Postgres database coming from the Azure Cloud. So right now, Sam is going to demonstrate you live what does it, how does it look like from CF developer perspective to, to work with such application that is backed by th those cloud providers. OK. <clears throat> Can everybody see? OK. Can everybody see that? Excellent. Maybe a bit again. OK, so I um, have access to a Cloud Foundry environment right here. Um, and the first thing I want to show you is um, that we have some service brokers registered here. So I can run the service brokers command, and you can see we have three brokers, um, an Azure broker, a Google broker, and an IBM broker. Next, what we'll look at is we'll look at what services are available from those brokers. And we can do that by looking at the CF service access command. We'll just get those. So you can see here they're ordered by the broker. So at the top, uh, these are all the Google services. Uh, then we have the IBM services, lots of Watson goodies. And at the bottom, 
a bunch of Azure, mainly data services, I think. But for the purposes of this demonstration, we don't actually need access to most of those. So we've only enabled, uh, we've only enabled for three services that we need. So that's uh, Postgres from Azure, um, PubSub from Google, and the Watson Vision Service from IBM. So if we have a look at our applications, we have the two apps that Gilgi was mentioning, a web app and a worker app. These are just both regular like CFGO apps, um, and they're stopped at the moment. So what we'll do is we will create the vision service from IBM, specifying the service name, a plan, and then an arbitrary name for the service, vision. So go ahead and do that. And this is going off to IBM's cloud and provisioning some abstract concept of a service that will allow us to get credentials with the bind operation in a second. Let's see how this goes. All right, amazing. So next, uh, we'll do the bind operation. And you remember from that diagram, it's the worker application that actually needs access to the vision service. So we'll bind it just to the worker app. And this will go and get the actual credentials, the API key that's required to go and talk to the vision service. OK, um, so for the rest of the services, we've pre-provisioned them, um, just because it takes a lot of time. Uh, so you can see the applications, uh, sorry, the services on the left, and then how the bindings work in the middle in the bound apps column. So our Postgres and our PubSub are bound to both the worker app and the web app, and our vision service is just bound to our worker app. So next, what we'll do is we'll start both our web app um, and worker app. And just while we do that, what we'll do is, oh, I've got it there already. We'll have a look at the environment for the worker app to see what the VCAP services look like. So uh, the first service you can see there is the Azure service. You can see it's got a Postgres connection string, all very sort of vanilla. And this is typically what service bindings look like um, for the majority of service brokers. The Google one's quite interesting. Uh, it's a completely different authentication model. You actually uh, get back private key information that you use then to communicate to Google servers. And finally, the IBM service is, again, different. It's an API key that you get back along with the URL. So let's head back. So our applications have started now. And I'm going to look at that and look at that. There we go. Um, so I'm actually pretty proud of this UI. Me and Gilgi <laughs> aren't UI designers, but this is top-notch material design, I can promise you. Um, so as you said, what we need to do is upload an image. Um, fortunately, oh, there we go. I'm trying to find my cursor here. Um, so what we'll do is find a nice image here. Uh, I don't know if you can see that on the screen. Let's see if we can. The right check. view. Yeah. This, this one. Screen. Wait, not that one. This one. Okay. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to take this image. We're going to upload it. It's going to go to our web app. It's then going to be sent all the way to Google servers, um, wherever they ho they're hosted. Uh, it's going to be picked up for subscription by our worker app, sent all the way back to our Cloud Foundry, then go off to um, IBM servers for classification. Then the resulting classification and image are going to be sent to Azure servers to be stored and then picked up by our uh, web app. So if we open that and click load here, um, we have some very simple logs for our worker app. So you can see it's received the image, it's classifying, and then it's stored it again in Azure and finish processing the message. And if we refresh, I can confirm with the power of three clouds that this is a lion, everybody. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. And you've already seen it, but this is pretty great. We've also got a not a lion. Um, and we'll see what Watson service thinks of this. So if we upload it, it's the same process. And it's actually pretty good. It's determined that that on the right is, is a dog and that on the left is a lion. So I was actually very impressed by this. This is actually awesome. Cool. But the main point, right, is that like, we are, we're like, as developers, we just picked these services um, and we built our application like, using all these different um, services from like, the expert that we wanted. We, want, like, we know IBM are great at like, Watson services, so we'll have that. Like, maybe our app would be higher throughput, so we want the Google Pub Sub service, you know, all that sort of thing. OK, let's head back to the slides. OK, so we talked about three different brokers and like the ecosystem of brokers that's emerged. But as we know, like the Open Service Broker API has brokers and platforms. So what about an ecosystem of platforms? Um, and so this is what we sort of wanted to, to do 
um, where we had Kubernetes doing exactly the same thing, talking to the same set of services. And that's what Gyorgy is going to show you now. OK, thanks, Sam. Thanks for the nice demonstration. OK, so right now, I'm going to show you the exact or almost the same workflow but uh, from a Kubernetes developer perspective or how we actually could push that exactly the same code base with exactly the same application, but to Kubernetes. Uh, I have pre-configured a demo magic script, so just to save you my poor typing skills. Uh, so don't be impressed with my fast typing skills. It's a script, uh, but the demo is live, so it's not a recording. So if anything goes wrong, you notice it immediately. So the first thing that we did, similar to the CF, we have configured the Kubernetes cluster and installed the service catalog in it and also registered three, the, the same three bro brokers, the Azure, the Google, and the IBM broker. And this is currently part of my, of my context. So I have a cluster, which is called Sam and, and Georgi, and it's installed with all those uh, things that we need. OK, the next thing that I'm going to show you, this is the equivalent of CF marketplace command, but in Kubernetes term. I'm using the service catalog CLI, and in this case, it's called get classes, which will return me, return me the list of available services. As you may see, this is exactly the same list of services, uh, but just put in different order. But we have services coming from, from Asia. We have services coming from Google, the, the spanner. We also have our Watson Vision combined service that we are going to use as part of our worker nodes. OK, so the next thing is I'm going to describe or to get more details about, about the Watson Vision service and see what are the available plans that, that it has. So it has the same set of plans as in the CF scenario. It has a light and a standard plan. And it also has a, a longer description about specifying what are the pros and cons of the different plans. So the next thing that I'm going to do is trying to provision a service instance, or this is the equivalent of CF create service command that I guess most of you are already familiar with. So again, we the, the, the command is different, it's called provision, but the semantics and the thing behind the scenes is actually the same. So we just specify a name, an identifier for our service instance, and we specify what is the class or the service and the plan that, that the service instance should be derived from. So we get an immediate response for that operation. However, uh, all operation in Kubernetes are asynchronous, so we still need to run additional command in, a, in order to get the real status of that operation. So this command in the terms of service catalog CLI is called describe, so I'm describing an instance and give the identifier the name of my instance. So as you may see from the status field, the service is ready. It's available out there in the cloud somewhere in, in the uh, IBM data centers. So uh, we have it ready, ready, good to go. So if you remember the diagram uh, that I've shown you earlier about the details of the OS BAPI, we need one more additional thing to connect to that instance. This is the binding, actually. And as you may imagine, the equivalent command in service catalog is called bind. And we provide the name of the instance. And we add additional identifier. This is the name of the binding. So we actually put some kind of label for the binding. Remember this name, because later on we will use it. We call it vision binding, just to associate it with our service instance. But it is, it's a thing that we will use later on. Again, the same immediate list response, but actually behind the scenes, something asynchronous might happen. Uh, I'm going to again describe the binding based on the identifier, but provide the additional show secrets flag, which will actually try to decode my binding and present me in plain text what were the credentials that the broker has returned to the, to the platform or to my application. So as you may see, and I guess as most of you may have expected, we have a URL. This is the place where our service actually lives. And we have an API key, which we will use to authenticate and authorize our application when it connects to that service instance. 
Okay, yeah, the, as Sam already explained, the process for the other service instances is exactly the same. I mean, if you want to provision and bind a Postgres or the cloud pub sub messaging queue, the process is exactly the same. You just change the names and just change the values of those parameters. So just to save us some time, we have pre-configured those instances that are necessary for our application to live. And we also have a corresponding bindings, which are for, the, for those service instances. So the next thing that I'm going to show you is how actually to connect that binding or start using that binding as part of our application environment. This in the Kubernetes world happens in the deployment descriptor file or happens in the app environment section. This is the environment that is available for our application when it boots. So what we did here was actually when uh, we used the binding or we the refer or reference the secret that is associated with that binding and put that as a value as a new environment variable that will be available on boot time of our application and our application knows how to work with this vision API key environment variable so the, our library could, could start and could, could, could work. The same thing happens for the URL here. Okay, let's, let's test this thing. Let's see whether the application actually will be able to start and work with, with the service instances and with those bindings. This in the terms, because I, we have created a separate deployment for both components. This in the terms of Kubernetes, we create those deployments using the kubectl out of that deployment descriptor, the YAML file that I've shown you. So yeah, again, asynchronous operation, so we could not be 100% sure that the thing is uh, running, so we need to run one more command and describe our, and get our deployments. And as you may see, our deployments are already available or our apps are already available for consumption. Or uh, Just to one side note here, because in Kubernetes, uh, slightly different than, than in CF, when an application or a container is started, it doesn't have a public IP address or a DNS address associated with it. So we here need one additional resource in the terms of Kubernetes called a load balancer service, which will actually map a public IP address, which we could access from a browser, to our application running as part of the, of the cluster and as part of the pod. So we have pre-created pre that uh, load balancer service and it is available on this external or on this IP address. So when we open the address, you could see the same pleasant UI that Sam already shown you. So right now I won't get into the details of that because the process is pretty much the same. I will just try and see whether it's working. I'm going to use this image uh, for, for the for the classification, hit the upload button, wait a few seconds, hit the refresh, and yeah, it's working. So we have our image classified, and as you may all see, uh, a pretty good and concrete classification, so it looks like a good dad food that everyone could have once this presentation is <laughs> over. Okay, this was the, the demonstration that we wanted to show you, how it looks like actually from Kubernetes developer perspective and how we actually could use uh, the same code base and push it to a different platform. The last bit that we wanted to share with all of you and that we thought that is going to be interesting for everyone were the learnings that we made during preparing for this talk and during create, creating this demo. There were quite a lot of things, if I have to be honest. Uh, the first thing that we were quite surprised in a good way, uh, despite the fact that we are every day working with the specification and we know how powerful it is, we, we were very surprised about the huge variety of services available out there coming from different providers. So it's definitely a good thing, and I personally felt like a kid in a candy store when I saw how many services I could consume as a developer. The next thing that we are happy about is how actually similar working from both platforms uh, looks like from a CF-related uh, 
from services related workflows. I mean, the user experience there is pretty much the same. You need to learn a, new, a few new flags, and you need to learn to install a new CLI, and you're good to go. You can switch, or you can use both, and you don't have to learn almost anything new. The concepts, the concepts are exactly or pretty much the same. The next thing is, like this worked. Like we sort of set out with this goal of trying to consume these three services. We sort of came up with the name of the talk, and then we were like, right, we'll go and figure out how to do it. Um, but the good news is it worked, uh, which is awesome, but with some caveats. So for the eagle-eyed amongst you, uh, when I did the CF service broker command, you might have noticed that the URLs of the service brokers were actually Cloud Foundry apps. Um, and that's because to get the providers working, we actually had to use proxies. Um, and for different reasons. So for the Google case, they actually support a very custom JWT OAuth uh, flow uh, that Cloud Foundry just doesn't support. So we, had a, we have a proxy for that. And for the IBM case, their services are actually private to IBM Cloud. Um, so I think like, I've talked to a few people about this. And from our, this, this, is, this definitely wasn't possible a few years ago. So like the general direction is that these things will be consumed. And other providers are working on offering full SaaS offerings of their brokers, in which case like, the proxies won't be like, required. The final thing that you might have sort of wondered is, um, in our demonstration, we pushed the same app to different, two different places and same set of services, but we never shared data across the two platforms. And I don't know if you saw Florin's talk at the uh, keynote this morning, but that's the sort of thing that the service manager project is hoping to address. So hopefully next summit, someone will come along and do an improved version of our talk and maybe show the web app running in CF and worker apps running in Kubernetes and communicating through services. Awesome. Well, thank you very much. That was our uh, demonstration showing you know, different cloud providers, uh, services all being consumed in one app and two different platforms. Does anybody have any questions? If you're interested in this stuff, there's two other things happening at Summit I can shout out to. So there's, first of all, if you're interested about services in CF, uh, Nikki is doing a talk later about uh, the services API team in CF. I think that's at 5.30. And then if you're interested in like Kubernetes and CF experience for services, Luis and Alex are doing a lab. I think there's one session tomorrow where you can go and play around with that live. If there are no questions, thank you very much. Thank you.